I mean, the murder rate in Chicago is just off the charts. Drugs, declining morals, we fear being sued, going broke, finding a mole on our back, a big earthquake coming and hitting Oregon. Max Lucado in his book Fearless tells about on 817 on the evening of March 3rd, 1943, a bomb siren went off in London, England. Bus drivers screeched to a halt, let all their passengers off. Taxi cab drivers did the same. Motorists stopped, got out of their cars, looked in the air. People screamed, they're bombing, it's coming. Shopkeepers and uh, shoppers, uh, some of them dove and just hit the, hit the sidewalks. Bethnal Green Underground Station, uh, 500 people crowded down there quickly. Within 10 minutes, another 1,500 joined them. Problems began when a rush of people hit the steps at the same time. A woman carrying a baby stumbled on one of the 19 uneven steps going down into the station. And people tumbled on top of her like dominoes, like laundry going into a basket. Things got even worse when people in the back, latecomers, thought people were blocking them. They weren't. And they began to shove. The whole thing only took about 15 minutes, but it took them three hours to untangle all the bodies. And when they did, they found 173 men, women, and children dead. Bombs didn't fall. They never did come that night. Fusillades didn't cause the deaths. Fear did. Fear's been making a good living lately. Christians live in fear of anti-Christian sentiment. We feel in our country, we feel the calls with increasing intensity that Christians ought not be able to propagate their faith and even express their moral views. We still have religious freedom, but we feel it closing in. It's particularly unpopular to be a Christian on a high school campus or a college campus. Christians in the first century felt fear. When Emperor Nero in 64 AD began chopping off the heads of Christians and feeding other Christians to the lions, all Christians throughout the empire could feel the increasing heat. They feared losing their jobs. They feared being persecuted, maybe being killed. The Apostle Peter sent a letter to Christians. We've been looking at his letter, and so far he said, you need to expect suffering. It will occur. You will be persecuted. But see that you live holy lives so that you don't bring suffering on yourselves by your stupid mistakes. Then he said, grow up in Christ. See that you know the Scriptures and learn how to pray and come together with others for fellowship so you don't throw in the towel when suffering comes. And some asked him, Peter, should we share that we're followers of Christ? Should we share our faith? He says, yes, of course. He said, they said we could be persecuted. We could lose our jobs. He said, it's more important to obey God than your culture. And then in 1 Peter 3, 8 to 22, we're going to look at today, if you'd like to take a Bible in the seat, under the seat in front of you, it's on page 1222. Peter says one of the best defenses in a post-Christian or anti-Christian culture like we have is a clear conscience. Verse 16 of chapter 3, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. He says if you keep a clear conscience, people will have less reason to malign you. Sometimes we bring trouble on ourselves by our own sins. Peter says you don't get credit for bringing trouble on yourselves. When we don't have a clear conscience, we feel guilty. Uh, we don't feel, we feel crummy if we're a follower of Christ. We feel crummy about ourselves. Fyodor Dostoevsky uh, said in his uh, classic Crime and Punishment, if a criminal is not 
uh, convicted, he will suffer punishment anyway because his conscience will convict him. He will feel guilty and it will make him absolutely feel miserable. If you've given your life to Christ, God gives you the Holy Spirit to live in you. The Holy Spirit makes very clear the difference between right and wrong. So cultivating a clear conscience is critical for a follower of Christ. I want to ask two questions today. How do we cultivate a clear conscience? And what are some good things that come from cultivating a clear conscience? And I'll take some questions at the end. So if you think of something while I'm talking, just make a note of it and you can ask. Peter suggests five ways to cultivate a clear conscience. Number one, be humble. Verse 8, finally all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate, and humble. We're to be like-minded, like Jesus Christ. He was humble. He humbled himself by leaving his glory in heaven, being born as a baby. Then the apostle Paul said, he's, said he humbled himself even to death. Philippians 2.8, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. C.S. Lewis, in one of his Narnia tales, Prince Caspian, which came out as a movie, I'm going to say, six or eight years ago, Prince Caspian, with the help of Aslan, who's the Christ figure, the massive lion, defeated the enemies of Narnia, and then Caspian meets Aslan for the first time. He kneels and he kisses his paw, and then Aslan asks him, Are, do you feel sufficient to be king of Narnia? Caspian says, I don't think so. I'm just a kid. And Aslan said, good. If you'd felt sufficient, it would have been clear evidence that you weren't ready. I declare you now king of Narnia. Being humble is the opposite of being proud, which is the root of all sin. When you're humble, you're quick to admit when you're wrong, confess it, and ask forgiveness. And when you do that and someone forgives you, you're back to a clear conscience again. The second way to cultivate a clear conscience is to love. Still verse 8, finally all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate. Uh, being sympathetic, loving one another, and being compassionate are all can be summarized with the word love. When we're sympathetic, we sympathize with other people and we empathize with what they're feeling and thinking. It's pretty well known that wives, when they have a problem, you probably could say all women, when they have a problem and they want to talk about it, husbands think they want them to solve the problem. <clears throat> but really, they just want to be heard. They just want to be listened to, empathized with. One uh, husband didn't get this, and here's what happened to him. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me. And... I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head, and it's relentless, and I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most, is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there... Stop they... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out <clears throat> that maybe the nail is causing... You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. Yeah, well, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, you're out. not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just... Sometimes it's <clears throat> like there's this achy... I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on! Ow. If you would just don't <laughs> try to see things my way. All right, to love other people is to put their needs ahead of your own and to empathize with them. Uh, to be compassionate is to be really caring with people when they're struggling. 
uh, business consultant Patrick Lencioni came out with a book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. It was a huge bestseller, uh, helping businesses, nonprofits, and churches build more effective teams. Well, then people begin to ask, well, what kind of person is an ideal team member to be on one of those teams? And so Lencioni last year came out with the book, The Ideal Team Player. And he came up with the subject for the book just by looking at his own company. They just kind of knew intuitively the kind of workers they wanted. And they came up with there are three characteristics of a good team member. In other words, these are three characteristics you want for a person you hire to be one of your employees, to be on your staff. First, the person has to be humble. This is the most important one. It's, it's not about them. It's about the, the team. It's about the company. Second, they have to be hungry. They have to be a hard worker. They have to be willing to roll up their sleeves and take initiative. You don't have to coddle them. They get things done. Three, they have to be smart. And this isn't so much intellectually smart, it's people smart. They know how to deal with people, relationships with people. They can walk into a room and they can just kind of sense what everybody's feeling. And Lencioni says they need to have all three characteristics. If they're just humble, they'll be a doormat. If, they'll ju if they're just hungry, they'll be a bulldozer. And if they're just smart, you know, they'll just be a people pleaser. If they have two out of the three characteristics, it's a little harder to discern. But it's one plus one equals two. But one plus one plus one, if they have all three, equals nine. So you want them to have all three. If they're just humble and hungry, they're a mess maker. If they're humble and Smart, you know, they're just, uh, you know, uh, a polit it's, um, uh, I don't remember what is uh, humble and smart. It's probably up on the board. A lovable slacker, of course. And then um, if they're, uh, let's just do it this way. What's the next one? <laughs> um, if they're smart and humble, I could do so much better if I just watched this. They're, like a, they're the worst person to hire. They're a skillful politician. They make you think that they're humble, but they don't care about anybody else except themselves. So you want people with all three characteristics. How do we hire good employees? How do we hire good staff? Lencioni says, we have such low rigor. Two years ago at the... NFL draft, two quarterbacks were supposed to go high. Teddy Bridgewater from Louisville and Johnny Manziel, Manziel from Texas A&M. Teddy was expected to go in the top half dozen. Manziel was supposed to go in the middle of the first round. Teddy had all three of these characteristics. He was humble. It was never about him. It was about the team. He was always praising his line and his other players. He was hungry. He would work so hard off-season as well as during the season. And he was smart. He was great with people. Manziel was anything but humble. And he was a partier. And he was terrible with people. So the draft came and Manziel was selected in the middle of the first round as expected. Bridgewater wasn't picked until... The 32nd pick. Bridgewater went on to the Minnesota Vikings. He, be he became an NFL Rookie of the Year. Next year, he was selected to the 2015 Pro Bowl. Led the team very well. Manziel was a total washout. Suspended for substance abuse. Assaulted his ex-girlfriend, or allegedly his ex-girlfriend, and breaking her eardrum. So what happened? Why did Clearwater not get selected until 32? Well, the players go to a college combine. At the combine, they measure everything. And Clearwater, um, 
Teddy's fingers were measured as a quarter inch too short. So he dropped. And they ignored all the other characteristics that are far more important for a successful player. A third way we cultivate a clear conscience is to repay evil with a blessing. Verse 9, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. If someone criticizes you, says something terrible about you, if you're like me, you want to hold a grudge and maybe get back at them. But Peter says, no, no, God doesn't want you to do that. You are to repay evil with a blessing. You respond with kindness, gentleness, and self-control. Solomon says much the same. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. If someone snaps at you when you come home at night, how you respond may determine how the rest of the evening goes. The key to repaying evil with a blessing is a readiness to forgive. If someone treats you unfairly, and you're holding on to bitterness and anger, you're going to be hard-pressed to give them a blessing. If you're filled with resentment, you're going to have a tough time keeping a clear conscience. So who is there that you need to forgive? Fourth, to cultivate a clear conscience, Peter says you need to speak truthfully. Verse 10, for whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. Deceitful speech means lying. Not telling the truth. We're to tell the truth. And if we do not, we're to confess it immediately. We cannot keep a clear conscience unless we tell the truth. Fifth, to cultivate a clear conscience, Peter says we need to turn from evil and do good. Eleven, they must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. To turn from evil and do good is to seek to live in purity. Peter has already talked about that when he says, Obedient children, do not live by your former lusts, which were yours in your ignorance, but as him who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct. For it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. To keep a clear conscience, we must pursue holiness. Do you see how important cultivating a clear conscience is that is critical for a follower of Christ. So what are some good things that come from keeping a clear conscience? Peter says the benefits are huge. He mentions at least three. One, you receive God's blessing. Verse 9, on the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Then he goes on to quote David from Psalm 34. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and keep their lips from deceitful speech. If you want to have good life, see good days, then tell the truth. Verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who doesn't want to see the creator of the universe watching out for them? Who doesn't want to know that when they pray, God listens? His ear is attentive to their prayers. 13, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? Peter says if you do good, you're going to stay out of trouble. 14, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. This is the theme of the book of 1 Peter. He says you will suffer. You will suffer just for being a Christian. You may lose your job. You may be mocked. You may be persecuted. But still, God is watching out for you. Gary Smalley, in his book, The Blessing, tells about a girl named Cheryl. In her family living room, there was a motto that said, Stand up. It wasn't pretty to look at, this plaque. Uh, it caused all kinds of harm in her family. It used to be, a, it came as from a longer motto that said, don't take nothing off nobody, stand up and fight. You know, that's a great slogan probably for frontier life, but it did nothing but bring wounds and hurt 
to Cheryl's family. I mean, look at Cheryl's father. He grew up with a father that taught him the philosophy, never give an inch. So Cheryl's father and mother fought all the time. Neither one would give an inch. It was death before saying you're sorry. And as the, her four brothers and sisters grew up, and they got tired of taking orders from dad, they stood up too. And so soon all seven of them were fighting. It was just a hothouse. It went on this way until Cheryl became a Christian. A friend invited her to a young life camp. And at the camp, she gave her life to Jesus. She got home, she walked in the house, she saw that motto, stand up. She thought, I don't see Jesus doing that. I've invited him into my life. And when he was spit on and mocked and beaten, he didn't retaliate. He didn't, he didn't stand up. He didn't threaten. And so she began to break some of the family rules. Right in the middle of an argument, even though she'd be mocked by her brothers and sisters, she'd say, you know, you're right, I'm sorry. End the argument. And she started saying, love you, mom, love you, dad, and would give them a hug. Her dad had never received the blessing, someone saying, I love you, and you're important to me, and touching him. And After about a year, her little sister was so impressed with how Cheryl had changed that she too became a Christian. And not long after that, her older brother did as well. The motto on the wall was beginning to shake. And last Christmas, as a baby believer, her father took the motto off the wall. Her whole family changed because Cheryl became a Christian and lived with a clear conscience in obedience to Christ. Another good thing that comes from a clear conscience, you're given opportunities to share your faith. Peter says, in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience. If you keep a clear conscience, you don't repay evil with evil. You tell the truth. You turn away from evil and do good. You love people. Two things will happen. One, God will watch over you. And two, people will notice. That's what happened in Cheryl's family. Her brothers and sisters couldn't believe it. What has happened to you? So you have to be ready for people when they ask, why have you changed? And you tell them, I invited Jesus into my life. He forgave all my sins. Can you believe it? All the things I did, he forgave And then you have to be ready to tell them how you invited Jesus into your life and the, the difference he's making. I'm not perfect yet, but he's, he's making a difference. And then you invite him to church with you so they can hear about Jesus too. One more benefit of cultivating a clear conscience, you experience Christ's resurrection power. You say, I don't know if I can keep a clear conscience. I get angry with people. I hold grudges. I don't speak the truth. I'm self-centered. I'm not very humble. I fail to love people. I have problems with lusts. I do so many things that are wrong. Well, here's the good news. There's power available to you. Verse 17, For it is better if it's God's will to suffer for doing good than doing evil. This is why Peter tells us to keep a clear conscience. It's better to suffer for doing good than doing bad. Then Peter tells us about Jesus Christ's resurrection power that's available to you. Verse 18, for Christ also suffered for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the Spirit. There's the power. He was made alive in the Spirit. He was raised from the dead. 19, after being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah. 
while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. After Jesus was raised from the dead, Peter tells us that he descended into hell and he spoke to the imprisoned spirits, uh, imprisoned spirits there. If these were humans, these would be people who mocked Noah when he was building the ark. And Jesus is telling them, look, I've died for all sins now, yours included, and I've been raised from the dead. He was giving them the good news. More likely, these are evil spirits that Peter's talking about who intermarried with humans. Moses tells the, us about them in Genesis 6, verse 2. The sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. These were the fallen angels of God. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Jude, Jesus' half-brother, tells us even more. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting change for judgment on the great day. Jesus was announcing to them his victory over all evil spirits, all powers, all angels, all authorities, and over sin and evil. Verse 20, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built, in it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. We had a baptism last week. Many of you were here. Seven people were baptized. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. When you give your life to Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit, and you pledge to follow Christ the rest of your days. And to keep a clear conscience. This is your commitment to turn away from the sin for which Christ died for you. You're saying, I want to live a different way. I want to go this way. 21, it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. There's power available. It's Jesus' resurrection power. We now serve Jesus who has all authority over all authority, angels and demons he lives in you by the power of the Holy Spirit. You're right. You don't have the power to keep a clear conscience. But the Holy Spirit does. You depend on Him who raised Jesus from the dead. And you have all the power you need to cultivate a clear conscience. We're all weak. We're all prone to sin. But if we tend to depend on the Holy Spirit and His resurrection power, and we pray throughout the day for His help. I mean, I must have prayed 25 times yesterday as I was doing different things for God's help. He gives us all the power we need to cultivate a clear conscience. And cultivating a clear conscience is critical for a follower of Christ. All right. Anybody want to ask a question? Where's my friend Brandy? Hey, here she goes. All right, if you want to ask a question, just raise your hand and Brandy will uh, bring you the microphone. Uh, the rules are no questions too hard. <laughs> Anybody? Brandy, they're stunned. I know. Going once, <laughs> twice. Anybody? Okay, there's one over there. All right. First. This is Wendy. How do you give a blessing? A blessing. You say give a blessing. Uh, give a blessing instead of three. You know, how do you do that? You say repeat it. Yeah. Well, I mean. I'll give you a couple answers. In general, it means instead of repaying evil for evil, you give a blessing. You give kindness. You give your soft spoken. You give a gentle answer instead of a harsh response. Uh, the actual elements of a blessing are touch, 
uh, expression of love, expression of high value, you, you, you're important to me. Um, no, there's a couple more, I can't remember, okay? All right, I've got to go all the way over here, Brandy, to, where is it, Tom? Derek. Um, defining blessing, <laughs> uh, right, but also forgiveness. Uh, you know, you're saying those that sin and lie and deceive and all the rest of that stuff. Um, to turn around and give a blessing, just and, and I was going to say, what's that mean? Um, great, good job. That that's uh, we. I appreciate that. <laughs> And then forgiveness, it's like, oh, well, you know what, I forgive that, uh, even if they don't want it or anything else. I, I don't, you know, that's where it's kind of really fuzzy to me. Right. Well, uh, to, to the, you respond, uh, uh, an, another element of blessing would be to respond by forgiving them. That means you forgive them in your heart. Uh, you just say, you know what, God, you've forgiven me a lot. They treated me terribly, but I'm going to forgive give that person. Now, that doesn't mean you say good job or thank you. I mean, that's silly. Uh, you, don't, you don't believe that. You, uh, you know, you, you, it doesn't mean you're ever going to trust the person again. You just, you're going to forgive them. It's not going to ruin your life. You're not going to live your life in anger when, when, with a grudge and resentment. You're going to forgive them and move on. All right, thanks, Carla. That was tough to do. Thank you, Brandy. All right, so uh, why don't we pray? Father, thank you for Peter's very probing words to us today. And uh, we live in a world of declining morals, but he's raising the bar and saying, you know, keep a clear conscience. Keep as pure as possible, just the opposite of what we see in our world. So thank you, and may we do that. We can't do that, Lord, so we need your Holy Spirit. We need your resurrection power. Help us to do that. All right, so I want to give you a moment to pray. Uh, I think it would be a prayer of confession, uh, just asking him to forgive you anything that's, you know, it's, you, you don't have a clear conscience. You need to get something off your chest. If you've never invited Jesus into your life, you could just say, I believe you're God's son and I want you to come in and forgive my sins, and I want to make you my Lord. So I'll give you all a minute to pray. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray.